This is James Taylor, and you're listening to The Creative Life. The Creative Life podcast is a show created for you, the creative. If you're looking for inspiration, motivation, and advice while at home, at work, or on your daily commute, then this show is for you. Each episode brings you a successful creative, whether that's a musician, writer, artist, designer, performer, educator, or creative entrepreneur. They share their journey, their successes, their failures, their creative process, their insights, and much, much more. This episode is sponsored by C-School, the online school for creativity training. If you'd like to unleash your creative potential and access a free creativity blueprint training series, then just head over to c.school. That's www.c.school for your free training series. In today's episode, I speak with Kit Pang of Boston Speaks. And we talk about his journey from professional dancer to professional speaker, how to get into a flow state on stage and ways to structure your keynote presentations. Enjoy this episode. Hey there, it's James Taylor, and I'm delighted today to be joined by Kit Pang. Kit Pang is a communications expert, TEDx speaker coach, keynote speaker, host of the Boston Speaks series, and the founder of Boston Speaks. He is on a mission to help individuals become exceptional speakers and communicators. Kit's seminars and talks have been described as super fun, engaging, soul-searching, and insightful. It's my great pleasure to have Kit with us today. So welcome, Kit. James, thank you. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you. Uh, thank you for having me on to speak to your audience today. So what's going on in your world just now? Uh, my wife and I, we adopted three cat, uh, two new cats. So <laughs> we were supposed to schedule this call a few weeks earlier. But right now, we're going through some cat issues. That's our main <laughs> thing. Because, you know, your personal life affects your business life. Absolutely, it's is all is all tied in tied in together. So, are you having to teach the um the cats some communicate cats some communication techniques as well? <laughs> or are they not listening to you? No, exactly. No, actually, James, this is what I teach a lot in my seminars. Because have you heard of um? Do you know who the dog whisperer is? No, I don't know this. I, I've heard of the horse whisperer. Yeah. Anyway, same exact thing. The horse whisperer. So in uh, you know here. They have a reality TV show. It's, it's called The Dog Whisperer. They call him Caesar, Caesar Malone or Caesar Malone. And I usually talk about this with communication is because even with the horse whisperer, the, um, whenever you get in, in, in front of a trainer like that, they know how to relate with the animals. Now, here's the thing. If you go talk to the dog whisperer and I take back my dogs, my dogs might be bad again, but with the dog whisperer, they magically somehow know how to relate and they're good again. And that's the same thing with public speaking and communication skills, because it's basically people skills. Do we know how to relate with people? It's not a, it's not a luck that the horse whisperer, horse whisperer or the dog whisperer, right? It's not luck. It's, it's something that they're doing to relate with the animals. And that's the same exact thing with honing down your communication skills. Do you know how to relate with people so in the same way that that we we can train animals to to do certain things and to um you know to kind of behave at certain times and to do other things to do can you can, is communic is uh speaking something that can be trained or do you, are you is it something that someone's born with there was you, you know who warren buffett is mm. uh and you know i guess dummy i really know who warren buffett is so they asked warren buffett they said mr buffett what do you think is that one skill that people should learn to become more successful in life? And he said, without a doubt, mastering your, your, your public speaking skills will raise your value by 50%. And if you guys know him, you know he's one of the richest guys in the world. And he dropped the number down because he said, public speaking and communication skills, you don't need an IQ of 200 to master, but it's a people skill that we use day in and day out. Uh, as an effective leader, you have to know how to relate with other people. So yes, James, you know, you can train on your speaking skills, you can train on your listening skills, but at the end of the day, you're just basically training on hmm, how well you understand other people. If that makes sense, absolutely. And for for you, Kit, I mean, where did this interest in communications and in, in public speaking, keynote speaking, where did it all begin for you? So, one thing that most of your audience would not know about me is I used to be a. Um, you ever see those people street perform in the streets? Mm -hmm. I used to be a uh, a hip hop street performer. You know, break dancing, yeah. spinning on my back, and everything. So, I used to be a professional dancer for fifteen years. And I remember this very clearly. 
I was born in Hong Kong. And when I was six years old, my family and I, we came to Boston. And I was in kindergarten, you know, first or second grade. And this kid came up to me. And this kid said, Kit, man, you're whack. And well, first of all, I didn't even know what that meant. But he said, I'm like, I'm like, what are you talking about? And he said, Kit, you're not, the, 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 the beat, you're tapping this beat out on the table, but it's not making any, it's, it's noise, it's not rhythm. And I said, no, it's not. I said, it's rhythm. And he said, no, it's not. You know, we went back and forth. And so at the end, he tapped it out for me. And when I was listening to him repeat back my rhythm, it was not rhythm. It was noise. The thing was, I was listening to my own rhythm in my head. And I wasn't listening to the rhythm that was going on in the outside world. Mm. And my, my, my interest of communication relates to this as because when I started to become a dancer, I've noticed it's not how well I dance as a creative artist myself, but how well the audience relates to my dance moves. And I always had a fascination with, with just the way people move or the way people communicate is because of the feeling. The feeling was what I got out of dancing because I was able to be by myself. That's the same exact feeling I got when I entered a public speaking competition in college. I used to be very scared of speaking. I know my hands would shake. And, and that's the first time I found out there were butterflies in my stomach because I had to give out a public, you know, to speak in public. But I practiced my butt off maybe till 2 a.m. It was a public speaking competition I entered. And I entered it because, well, I could win $1,000. But when I got on stage, I felt like I was in the zone. I'm not sure, James, if you ever felt like you were in the zone. Oh, absolutely. But you know when you're yeah. in the zone? Yeah, yeah. Things slow down. Time slows down. You feel like you can do everything. That's how I felt on stage. You're suddenly in one of those, ma was, those Matrix movies where everything slows down a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. What was your, actually, I'm, I'm interested to hear what was your Matrix moment later on too. But I felt that I was, I was able to be myself. And that's my passion, to help people fall in love with public speaking. And if they can get into that zone every single time, they can own the stage, they can feel great, the audience will love them, they are in the zone. And that's the moment where I think it's most powerful, no matter what techniques they're doing. And you what, have to get in the zone, and no matter, yeah, they're getting it, getting mm -hmm, in the, getting in the zone. Funny enough, I was I was talking to uh, to uh, someone early from the Harvard Business Review, and um, and they they were talking about how we often, as, uh, as whether speakers or performers or executives or athletes, you kind of go through a little a pre-show ritual, a little pr before you kind of go into the creative what you're doing, whether that's to persuade other people or to to create to present in some way. You know, many of the the best people at this, they they kind of go through a little pre-show ritual. So, when when you were kind of that first time you went up onto the stage there and presented in front of others, did you have any little kind of pre-show ritual that kind of helped you get into the zone, or or is it something maybe did you kind of develop one as time went on, you became a more experienced speaker? I think for me is at first I didn't have anything, but as I kept on teaching and speaking, I found that I was more pumped up every single time. They asked Olympians, how do you feel when you go on and do your main thing? All of them, they said they're pumped up and they're ready and they're excited to go. You know, Tony Robbins, he, he takes an ice bath, that guy. He does 25 push-ups. Uh, Amy Cuddy, you know, she's the power pose lady. She said, stand in the bathroom for two minutes, put your body this way and your brain will start feeling this way. And I, I agree with both of them because if you are a basketball pl a player and you're going to a championship game, you can't be thinking, oh, I'm not going to shoot that free throw. You're probably on that bus listening to motivational music, pumping yourself up. So I naturally, I'm like, oh, I'm going to teach again. I love it. That's what's going on in my mind. I love it. Um, but what about you, James? Do you have one? Yeah, I, I have a, I have a couple of little things. I think music is important uh, for me. I like kind of getting in there. And I also, I don't really like having any conversations about five, 10 minutes before I go on because I, you, I kind of get into a little bit of a zone. And I mean, I, I've, I, I suppose I've been kind of thankful because I've been going on stage since I was about like 10 years old um, as, as a performer first mm -hmm. and then as an artist and then, and then as, as a speaker. So I feel, I actually feel very comfortable on stage um, where I know a lot of people that's kind of sounds a bit weird. Um, but for, for me, it feels like, it feels like it's like home is, is, is a more com is a very comfortable place. Sometimes that in the real world is the, is the place it can be, uh, is more stressful, <laughs> if that makes sense. 
But yeah, it does make sense. Actually, James, I want to ask you now, when was your, your, your Matrix moment? My Matrix, in terms of speaking or in terms of or being on stage? Anything. Anything. Uh, on stage, music. Do you know, uh, do you know I, I remember very clearly, and I think this, I, I, when I speak to a lot of speakers and a lot of entertainers, performers, that they, they maybe have all had a, a moment kind of similar to this, is that moment where you're maybe up on stage, you're either speaking. In my case, I was up, I'm a, I was originally a drummer, so I was playing up drums. And up on stage, mm-hmm. and you you kind of look at, you look around your your kind of things are just kind of clicking. They're all kind of working at the same time. There's a, there's a flow there. You're going to you know what psychologists would call a flow state, but also the other thing that's going on is you're noticing the reaction of the audience, and you're seeing the transformation that you're having on an audience. Whether that's to because people are just really enjoying themselves with the music, or because you see that that light in their their eyes and it's one of the reasons i, I love whenever i'm speaking on stage if, if i could speak to the, the av team is if they can ensure because oftentimes they'll, they'll put the lights down really really low i said if possible if you can if you can keep the lights on for like the first two rows it really helps me a little bit because i can see their eyes i can see whether something's working or not i, I don't know if, mm-hmm. if you know as a speaker yourself if you can kind of recognize that that same sensation yeah, no, I, I I agree with you. Sometimes, if even if it's dark, I try to look people in the eyes yeah. too. Uh, you know, everyone has their own own way of doing things, and I think that's what's most important. They 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 figure it out what it is that makes them shine. Even though there's a bunch of techniques, uh, it's whatever makes them shine that's the best technique for them. And what about when it comes yeah. to then structuring your your keynotes? Let's say you've someone's been you've been you may be working with a client and they've been asked to go and give a maybe it's a big presentation or maybe it's a a talk to their community for example how should they start thinking about the structuring of the talk itself what's the best way to 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 begin should they be thinking primarily about the idea that they want to communicate first or should they be thinking about almost like a of a like a, a structure and a framework that they can fit things around yeah, I think there's one very simple uh, answer to that. I've, I talked to a lot of other great speakers and a lot of our world champions, you know, from the Toastmaster crowd too, and they say everything that's very consistent. What's that one message that you want people to take away, build everything around that? And so it doesn't matter how you structure it, you have to know what your main message is too. And that's how you can expand time and make make people value what you're talking about further. Mm-hmm. Because at the end of the day, if you want people to understand the power of communication, let's say, how can you structure your activities, your intro, your activity number two, your quotes, your stories around that? Uh, and if you can do that, by the time you structure everything around your one message, uh, first, the structure doesn't matter, but the, 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 there's the little tidbits. You can have a quote there, you can have a story there, but does it relate back to that um, one message that you're trying to get across and have you found you know that that one message or i suppose like as they would say that when a ted talk you know an idea worth spreading have you found that it can be more effective to have that that message that idea and have it repeated at certain points throughout the course and kind of building it that way or is it is it perhaps is it more powerful to wait and have have the big reveal of what the key idea that that brings all these threads together you know wait until towards the end of your talk before you deliver that I don't think there's a correct way to do it. Some people, in the front. Some people you can build a uh, suspense, but I have, to, I have to say this. People have to know something is coming, no matter if it's in the front or at the end. Some people, they can put it in the front and they put better things at the end. But they, they here's a message in the front, but they make it so much more important as they build it up. But again, everything goes back to building that one point because everything supports that. Um, I'm going to say, let's say Steve Jobs. If you go into a presentation with Steve Jobs, you know he's going to unveil something. He's building it up, he's building it up, and he brings it forth, and then he brings it up even more. Yeah. Uh, sometimes people would just, okay, I'm going to give it to you right now. Here's why you should sign up for this. They give it to you, and then they build it up even more. So they, they can so stack, that you know it's coming. They're kind of stacking the, yeah. the things on top of it. And actually, as you're yeah, so. you mentioning that, that kind of Steve Jobs, I'm thinking now of, 
of uh, Elon Musk did a, a classic Steve Jobs thing recently where they were he was announcing a new uh, truck, a new electric truck, and then they drive the uh, electric sports car out of the back, big, you know, big kind of reveal, and <laughs> and it was like, it was a classic Steve Jobs type of theatre. Yeah. And when it comes to yeah, no, 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 that's right. And when it comes to, you know, w- when you're working with, with someone and help and kind of training them around the, 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 the speaking, um, side of things as, as well. Uh, w- I mean, what role does this feedback have in, in that? D- do you kind of help prepare people for the fact that they, they may got, get no kind of clues, no feedback from their audience? And do you kind of, kind of help them deal with that? Cause I, I know for some speakers I've spoken, you know, I, I've had conversations with, they said, Sometimes that can be the strangest thing because if you're speaking in, in different countries, for example, in some countries, let's say in, in, in North America, they're very vocal they're about giving feedback. In other countries you go to, they kind of hold it back right until the end. And then, and then all the applause comes at the end. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm going to say uh, at the end of the day, your vibe attracts your tribe. I got that on Facebook, by the way. But <laughs> as a speaker, as a speaker, you can make your audience do anything that you want. Yes, it depends on the audience. Sometimes they hold their applause back. But if you want them to clap in the front, you can. Uh, of course, it also depends if you're saying if they clap at the end or they show no signs of facial expression. Well, sometimes that doesn't depend on you. That sometimes depends on how the event is set. Hmm. Maybe the, there's an event host that sets the mood this way. Um, and that's how the whole event is going to be. So you have to form along with how the whole event is going to be. But every speaker, they bring themselves into it. And people fall in love with you because you leave their mindset, you leave your mindset on them. You're basically leaving your, your, your mindset footprint mm. on them. Uh, and that's your experience. If you, if you think about the Tony Robbins experience, even if you have not seen Tony Robbins, the motivational guy live, Many people will say, oh, he's motivational, he's high energy. Now, if you say, what's the Dalai Lama experience? Most people will say, oh, maybe Zen, maybe really uplifting in a way. But you know going in that you will probably, you might even want to meditate before you go in. Mm -hmm. So you have this experience of that person. And at the end of the day, can people remember what your experience is? Or do you know what your experience is? Because if you do, you hone in on that power on what you say or, or what you do, they buy on how you make them feel. And whenever you open your mouth, you're trying to persuade someone. It's the same exact thing with speaking. You're, 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 you know, you're getting your mindset across. That's why it's so, so powerful. Even the people that you might follow, James. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you said it, like, you know, the vibe attracts your tribe. And, and I mean, I've had the good fortune of hearing like Dalai Lama speak and, um, it, it can, it reminds me of if you were to go and hear someone like a Eckhart Tolle, for example, we know there's, it's a very relaxed place in the room. There's a certain kind of energy in the room, but there's also humor. Um, it's only Dalai Lama is, is using mm-hmm. humor at, at different points as well. Whereas the Tony Robbins style, obviously more bombastic. The people that are there, they kind of, they, they kind of know what to expect to a certain extent. They're kind of going there and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, um, techniques which are very kind of more pop, well known in America and like the kind of call and response, like almost going to kind of the churches and things in, in America as well. Um, there's lots of little yeah. kind of great techniques and, and whether, whether he's kind of learned that, uh, is, is a learned skill as something that he's, he's kind of learned over time or it's something that he's, he's just kind of found through trial and error because of the fact he's spoken so many times and he's found, ah, this, this thing here works. It'd be interesting to, to ask that question to him as well. Yeah, I, I agree. So, James, I want to ask you this question. What's what's your experience? If people had to describe James Taylor experience, what would you say? Well, the the, the feedback I normally get is in, is that kind of word inspiring, which is 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 great. But it's also um, it's a little bit of a double edged uh, sword, <laughs> that word, because you kind of want for me anyway i want people to be leaving the room at the end that sensation is feeling inspired feeling that kind of energy but at the same time knowing what to do next what to do with it um so mm-hmm. it's not just a big you know rah 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 pump everyone up type of vibe and that's kind of generally not my thing any anyway but i kind of you kind of leaving them with with something that they can use to kind of transform their life and and hopefully if i've done my job right 
the person that's leaving the room is a very different person from that's that's kind of entered the room. I've taken some long held co- idea or concept that they felt, of course, that's the way it is, and I maybe change their their thinking about it. What what about you? I mean, what when people hear you speak, what's the what's the the phrase that they often use about your speaking? What do they leave the the room feeling? Uh, I would say interactive. I lean towards more of like the Tony Robbins side. Even if it's a keynote, I'm going to give them an activity to do. Yeah, uh, I think that's my style. Just very interactive, a takeaway. They have to do something, even like an improv game or something. And that's interesting because this is also where we're, we're starting to see a lot of, of the keynote speaking world go as well. Um, where because you have a lot more kind of millennials coming into the room, um, into the space, uh, th- there's a higher level of interaction that's, that's being required. They, mm-hmm. they want a more immersive experience. And, um, I was talking to, to someone the other day, a, a teacher who was saying that most of our students now mm-hmm. go through what we call a flip classroom where they don't sit and watch like a sit and have an, uh, an hour's lecture or two hours lecture. They might watch some of that stuff online, but the time that they have together is where they're, they're kind of working together on something. So, so they're consolidating learning. They're interacting with each other as well. So you've got an entire generation now that's leaving school, going into the workforce, and they then they will not put up for the idea of just necessarily sitting there for an hour while someone sp- speaks to them. And <laughs> there's no level of interaction. Yeah, exactly. I know. I think uh, like as we change, we have to change of our technology. Now it's getting way more interactive. How do you really, as a speaker or as a teacher, how do you use that to your advantage? Because we have all um, this technology or different different way of thinking. I say. And in this journey you've had as a oh. as, as a communication expert and as a, as a as a coach as well, can you talk about maybe one key insight or light bulb, some aha moment where you went, ah, oh, okay. This is the kind of this is a, is a key insight that you had, or a, a direction you decided to go with your work. I'm going to say this uh, back to your question of feedback. I was once of a uh, a TED speaker, and she said her TED talk was a hit in her mind and to the audience was because it was a combination of everyone's feedback on her, on her idea. And I think that is so powerful because even if you work with one individual or a coach, let's say you're doing your next presentation or you're getting better at a public speaker, at the end of the day, how can you get that out there and practice it and hear other people's feedback so that you take everything in and then you give it back out again? So I think that's one of the most memorable things that I keep on telling people. Even if you work with me, don't just take my opinion for it. You have to see what everyone else is thinking at the same time. And I guess that's that's where the power of things like uh, masterminds come in as well, where you maybe have you maybe yeah. a group with maybe ten other speakers, and you can, they can each you know critique uh, your work uh, um, you know, from from maybe different perspectives as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like you know, like, like a business too. I mean, you take what everyone wants and you just give it back. And we were talking a little bit earlier about um, some like uh, Tony Robbins and Dalai Lama. If you could recommend just one book to our listeners, maybe a book that could be about speaking or, or presentation, or it could be a book on, on business more more widely, what would that book be? Yeah, his name is uh, Sims White. He, uh, that's, that's the author, S-I-M-S-W-Y-E-T-H. And he has a book, it's called The Essentials of Persuasive Public speaking the essentials of persuasive public speaking it's not a whole book so each each page is it can be by itself it's like a little blog article blog article on each page but the way he writes is so profound uh he was on sitting on one of my panels uh, uh last last year he's a great person i love him uh every single time people mention this i'm like okay you have to read that book i even i work in corporations I, I go in and teach public speaking. I buy the whole corporate office this book just to give them as a gift. And what about you mentioned being a dancer kind of early in your, your career as well. If you could recommend one record, one album, maybe if there's, a, if there's a, a record that you use to kind of get yourself pumped up before you go up and speaking on stage or when you're in the process of writing a, a new speech, what would that record be? That record, I don't know. This, 
<laughs> this one is a hard one. I don't know. There's so many. I'm not going to answer that. There's so many. Nothing's coming to my mind, actually. <laughs> and, and, and what about like things like... Oh, oh, no. What about you? I'm going to turn, turn, turn that around. What about you? You're flipping a lot of these questions that I'm not usually used to being yeah. to being asked as, as well. I, do you know Do you know what? It's, it's funny because I, I was having this conversation with another speaker the other day, and uh-huh. he's, he's an author as well. And uh, and usually when when I'm working, I don't listen to music. Um, mm. uh, even though I've got music in my life all the time, because my ear is naturally going towards listening to it, and it's taking me away from the thing I do. Uh, a good friend of mine, Rolf Kent, uh, who wrote the music for uh, the TV show Dexter and lots of other great TV shows and movies, um, he actually brought out an album called um, Zen. Uh, I think it was just called Zen Music. I think it was called. Um, oh. And it's full of long tones. So there's no actual, it's like notes, and there's a lot of science behind long tones. So it's basically an album, like one track will be uh, B flat, and it's particularly a long tone. So you can kind of zone out a little, a bit like Gregorian charts. You can kind of zone out a little bit like to, to that kind of thing. So for me, I find that very useful um, when I'm working. And when I'm not working, then then I, I'm listening to to pretty much everything. I'm, I've got a, a big musical taste. Yeah, that's great. I think that the Zen music. Um, yeah, I try to put that on sometimes for my cats. <laughs> music, music for cats. And what about on, yeah. what about an online resource or a tool or a or mobile app like Evernote? What what do you what do you find really useful in terms of online tools? Online tools? Oh man, I'm a junkie. I like to go on AppSumo and I buy all the latest tools. Uh, AppSumo, there's a there's something for everyone. Absolutely, that's, that's a great. And I I know the uh, I think they're they're based in in uh, Texas, Austin, Texas, is I believe as well. And they're always they're yes, coming yes, up yes. With, with really really cool uh, Noah Kagan. There always coming up really really cool stuff as well. So a, a final question um, for you here. Let's imagine you woke up tomorrow morning and you had to start from scratch. So you have all the skills that you've acquired as a speaker, as a coach, as a communication expert. Um, but no one knows who you are. You know no one. You have to restart. What would you do? How would you restart? Yeah, the way I would do exactly the way I did it. So when I went from dancer to speaker, I had no credibility, no expertise, actually. I didn't do anything in the field of public speaking. I just started teaching workshops. I would find a place to host a workshop. I would put it on Meetup and Eventbrite, and I would do this probably almost every single day in the afternoon and in the nighttime. Um, I would do the exact same wow. thing. Just take action. Uh, I had to learn how to put BIS, butts and seats, and then CTS, convert to sales. Uh, <laughs> and that's a real yeah, skill. That's saying. a real skill to being able to do not just the butts and seats, but the converting to sale in a room. That, that's, a, that's a real learned skill. Yeah, so exactly the same thing. And James, I, I just want to say again, thank you for, for having me on today. It's great to hear about your story. I, I love the things that you're doing. Uh, the, the, the classes that you have online, the conferences, the summits that you have. Um, I look forward to, to seeing and hearing more of you. Well, thank you so much, Kit. And where's the best place if people want to reach out to you and learn more about Boston Speaks and the other things that you've got going on? Where should they go? Yeah, they can go on the website, bostonspeaks.com. And don't be intimidated. You can text me at 857-753-8211. You come to Boston, we're going to go out to Grasshopper, my favorite <laughs> vegan restaurant. The place. new vegan restaurant. We're both, we're both um, vegans as well. So we're going to go and check that out next time I'm in Boston. Kit, thank you so much for coming um, on the show. It's been a pleasure speaking to you today and learning about the art of listening and all the, the really cool work you're doing in Boston. Thanks for coming on. James, thank you so much. Hey, James Taylor here again. And if you're interested in living a more creative life, then I'd love to invite you to join me as I share some of the most successful strategies and techniques that high performing creatives use. I put them all together in a free downloadable ebook that you can get by going to jamestaylor.me. That's jamestaylor.me to get your free downloadable ebook on creativity.